welcome to the CHGO Bulls podcast HQ edition presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top rated sportsbook. Download the app and be sure to use promo code CHGO when you sign up. I am your host today. My name is Will Gottlieb. You can find me on Twitter at Will underscore Gottlieb. I am joined by my good friend down in Australia, Mark K at MK Hoops on Twitter. Mark, we just got done watching game one of the NBA finals. Nuggets cruise to a 104-93 victory over the Heat. Um, and I think we wanted to spend some time today talking about not only this game, but what can we sort of learn from the Heat, who obviously had a, a very improbable run through the Eastern Conference to the finals, but also the Nuggets and the way that they've constructed their roster. Um, and what can we take away and learn from as we look forward here to the Bulls offseason? But Mark, how are you doing? What was your uh, viewing experience of the NBA Finals? Are you excited? Are you sad that the Heat lost? Give me your thoughts. Um, I'm not sad. I, I'm, I don't really necessarily care who wins this series. I'm expecting the Nuggets to completely destroy the the Heat. It would be nice to see Jimmy play better than what he did today, but seemingly something's off with Jimmy, I'm assuming, because he just didn't look like he had it today. But similarly, I guess that's true maybe of the Heat more generally, given that they went seven games against the Celtics. The Nuggets have been uh, resting for over a week, um, having to conclude that series in Boston, then pretty much immediately head to Denver to take on the best team in basketball. It's a pretty pretty damn tough task, which is why I expected the Nuggets to sort of finish this off in four or five. So I didn't necessarily give the Heat much of a chance. Um, but I didn't also maybe expect them to be this bad tonight as well, but maybe that's just to be expected as well, given game one, and maybe they can do something a little bit differently in game two. But it just felt like the Nuggets just were in complete control the whole time. They they were probably even close to themselves in terms of playing their best basketball, and yet still at never at one point did I feel like they were uncomfortable in this game. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. They were not uncomfortable at all. And I, I think like, I don't want to take anything away from the nuggets because obviously they are the best team. As you said, in basketball, mm. they have, I think the most dominant action, at least one of, if not the most dominant action in their pick and roll with Jokic and Murray. Um, and just the, the continuity that they have and the way that they are Hashtag. clicking right now between their group, they just like are firing in all, all cylinders they, and like I thought that that was true about the Heat, and it is true about the Heat to a certain extent. You watch them in, in comparison to the Celtics, um, where they were just like kind of disengaged. They weren't always like reading the flow throughout each possession on offense or defense in the way that the Heat were. And ultimately, even though the Heat were undermanned and under talented, they were able to win because of their cohesion. And I think they've kind of met their match here. And now, the talent really does feel overwhelming. Obviously in that first quarter, it was like those Jokic high low passes to Aaron Gordon, who had like Gabe Vincent switched onto him for mm -hmm. easy layups under the rim. Everything was just a backdoor cut at the rim. Jokic just orchestrating from the elbows. And it's just, I don't know. Like the heat have a really good team defense. They scheme very well. Um, none of their guys with the exception of like Jimmy and probably obviously Jimmy and Bam, but um, none of those other guys are like elite one-on-one -on -one perimeter defenders. They kind of do it as a unit. They do it as a group, but I feel like this is a team where they need to be able to defend one-on-one -on -one because Murray will just dice you up and get to the rim and collapse you. And then it's kind of over. Or if you switch any of these pick and roll actions and you've got anybody outside of Bam and even Bam in a lot of these possessions has just no chance against Jokic. So the, the talent deficit, I think, feels more extreme than it has, even against the Celtics, who are one of the more talented teams in the league. And then on top of that, like I said, the cohesion. It's just, it's like, you know, for as well as the Heat are playing, and I do think they actually played a good game, they're just a, a notch below. Yeah. Well, they're the, the two most locked-in teams, probably the two best coach teams in the postseason. Um, everything you said about the Heat has been true, and that's why they've been able to overcome the box, the Knicks, the, the Celtics. But to your point before, like they've met the Nuggets who are more talented, but are as locked in as them. They're following the game plan as perfectly as you could possibly want. This team just feels like they're they're on a mission. Like that that's just been the the sentiment that they've been putting out and has been very visible off the screen 
in watching the Nuggets that that's something they're clearly trying to do, that they're completely, completely focused on the championship. And it's not just something that they're just saying. It's they're, they're living and breathing it, and you can feel it jumping off the screen. And it all starts with Jokic. I mean, more assists than a uh, field goal attempts today, which is just absurd. Oh, Maybe one just dominant 12 field goal attempt games I've ever seen from anyone ever. Just had complete control of the game. Um but the, the, the Nuggets themselves have scope for improvement as well because Jamal Murray with two for seven from the three-point line. Michael Porter Jr., two from 11 from the three-point line. So even though the Heat did some interesting things on defense and threw out multiple schemes, they probably played a lot more zone than what I was expecting. But in doing so, they did give up some clean looks to the Nuggets and the Nuggets just didn't make them. So whilst there's scope for the for the Heat to maybe get things going a little bit with as well with from their jump shooting, same is true for, for Denver as well. So... I don't see this series lasting very long. The, the, the Heat are just purely outclassed. This is the best team in basketball they're facing. And uh, I kind of feel sorry for them to some degree because of, because of the Cinderella run they've put together. But at the same time, like the Nuggets are just doing Nuggets things. And what really was clear to me in watching this game was, and probably something um, that was less relevant against the Celtics, but in watching the Nuggets versus the Heat, it just becomes very clear how much bigger Denver is and they're probably as versatile as good to weigh um, they have the ability to do a lot of different things in the same way that he can but they're just so many they're so just so much bigger like that starting unit is just ginormous I don't know how the heat have any chance of guarding that the uh the nugget starting unit but even the the, the nugget second unit when they're running Aaron Gordon at center like Aaron Gordon is you know he's, he's very close to in the same size as Bam like <laughs> Like if, if the Nuggets' second unit is as big as the Heat's general units, then that's a massive advantage that Denver have is going in their favor as well. So uh, just a lot of things pointing in Denver's direction. Obviously, um, obviously they've got the best player in basketball on their team, which helps. But uh, all these other smaller things as well, um, it's, all, it's all pointing to the Nuggets' favor at this point. Let's talk about the shooting here for a second. Obviously, that was a huge factor in Miami's run, uh, just like kind of, what seems like unsustainably hot shooting, um, obviously mm-hmm. in that Buck series, they were they went crazy in the Knicks series. They cooled off a little bit and then got super hot again against the Celtics. Um, you know, people have made note of the fact that they are somewhat regressing towards more of their season averages because of how poorly they shot during the regular season. Um, mm-hmm. But for the most part of this game, until really like this final couple of minutes in the fourth quarter, the Heat mm. just could not buy a bucket. Struis was like 0 of 9 on yeah. threes. Um, Duncan Robinson made of 1 five. of 5. Uh, mm-hmm. Really, it was like Kyle Lowry and, and Haywood Highsmith were the, the big three-point marksmen, um, as well as Gabe Minson. I forgot about him. Um, and then you look at the box score, 13 of 39, which isn't that bad. But like I said, a lot of those came late when the game was felt at least already decided. Um I think they're basically going to need to have just four really hot shooting nights in order to get this done. Like you said, the the way that Denver's offense right now is clicking, and they didn't even take that many threes either. I mean, eight of 27, um, they had a lot of good looks. Michael Porter Jr., it feels like that ball is going in every time. He was only two mm-hmm. for 11. Mm-hmm. I think they have a lot of scope to improve from deep, but to me... Um, it's, I think it's going to ultimately be like who makes the most threes in four out of the next six games. Um, or, you know, however many three, three games out of however for for the, uh, the nuggets here, but the free throws was, was also a huge discrepancy, only two for Miami and 20 for Denver. And I think it speaks to the fact that even though Jokic is not this like incredible rim protector, even though. You know, they were able to attack him a little bit in some of these pick and rolls. They just could not get all the way downhill to the rim. Bam was really the only consistent driving force of offense and everything for him was like an eight to 12 foot jumper. And you're just not going to hang around with a, a Nuggets offense if you're taking eight to 12 foot jumpers all game. The Heat have been really good offensively in this playoffs because of the hot shooting. They were, I think, last or in the bottom couple in offense during the regular season in large part due to the fact that they weren't shooting the ball well, but they just, I mean, there's just no chance unless they get super hot and that it does. I don't know what the right way to say it. Like it's, it's just a bummer, I guess that it's going to require just 
unsustainably hot shooting in order to keep these games close because it really does feel like the, the Nuggets are that much better and good for the Nuggets. Like they have put together an incredible team. And I think that kind of is the genesis for the discussion that we want to have today as it relates to the Bulls. But they really, I think, have just mastered their their roster around the star player in Jokic. And it's so apparent the way that the ball pings around the way that he is moving the chess pieces. It's just, it's incredible to watch him. Yeah, look, if you squint really hard, well, <laughs> Vucevic and Levine and Patrick Williams kind of looks like... <laughs> I can't even complete the sentence. I won't complete the sentence because it was a dumb thing to say. But um, yeah, it's, it's a perfectly balanced team. Um, and, and look, and this wasn't the case for the Nuggets in years past, but they've sort of remodeled their team in this offseason whereby they brought in additional wing support, which is a thing they didn't necessarily have in years, in years prior. But they brought in Aaron Gordon the year before that. This offseason, they brought in KCP, uh, Bruce Brown. They drafted Christian Brown. Um, they've kept Jeff Green along. So they've really prioritized two-way wings who can support Jokic and Murray, the, the, the foundation of that, you know, of, of the Devon Nuggets team. So from that point of view, it's been a really good and calculated uh, roster build. And it's just made them a really good two-way team from that perspective. Like Their defense isn't elite, but it's good enough. And it just sort of sets the foundation for the best offense in basketball, which we saw today was completely humming, even with... Even outside of the shooting element, the, like the Heat weren't making all these shots. Uh, sorry, the, even the Nuggets weren't making all their jumpers. But the ball, the way it was flowing, there was a brief period in that fourth quarter where the Heat zone took some stuff away from the Nuggets, but it didn't take them long to sort of figure it out and work their way through that Heat zone. And that's because they have the best passer in basketball on their team. I mean, there's so many unfair advantages that, that the, uh, the Nuggets have against the Heat. And to be fair, like I think the Nuggets would be doing this against any team that would have been coming out of the East. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to make this thing about how, you know, that they're going up against an eight seed, that the, that they're all, always going to demolish a team like Miami. But the fact that Miami did what it did against the Eastern Conference, and because of that, we shouldn't have had any confidence that you know the Celtics or the Bucks or whomever would have been doing anything differently against this this. Uh, this type of Nuggets team that we're seeing at the moment, who's just completely locked in and just the way they move the basketball is just beautiful and pure. And they, they remind me a lot of Spurs teams of years past. I think that's the best comparison for these Nuggets teams. And, you know, maybe the, maybe a team like the Celtics is more talented. Maybe they have more depth, whatever you, I mean, people can challenge me on that. I do think Boston is the most talented team in the NBA, but I think the Nuggets, uh, you know, they're just the most, the best coached, uh, the best, um, they have the most cohesion and the way they all play for each other and the, and the way they move the ball. It's just, uh, it's a beautiful thing to watch. And that's why it is so reminiscent of the Spurs of yesteryear. So uh, I just love the way they go about it. So uh, they've got three more to go and I'm pretty sure they're going to get it pretty quickly. Yeah, I think they're the best at the most things. Like they may not be the best at everything, but mm -hmm. they do almost everything at a super high level. Like they're in the top, you know, 10% of all these different categories. And like you said, I mean, maybe the Bucks or the Celtics on paper are talented enough that they could compete at a higher level. But like, I think that really undermines what we just talked about in terms of the cohesion and the togetherness that the Heat are playing with. But when you're facing up against a team that's doing that same thing, but better, it's just really tough to win. I had uh, Heat in five, or I'm sorry, Nuggets in five, before the series i wouldn't be surprised if it's a sweep i wouldn't be surprised if it goes six like i do think like you mentioned jimmy did not play well i think spolster mm -hmm. has a lot that he can look for and i think in game one on the road against a team that's clearly better than you what you have to do is sort of feel it out and look to see what that team is doing and then be the one that makes the first adjustments and if there's anybody that can make those adjustments and and push those buttons it's going to be spolster so I think they'll be competitive. I like the way they ended that game. And I think you have to feel good about, you know, cutting into that lead, making Jokic play those final minutes while also like starting to click on in terms of shooting. I think they'll be more competitive next game. But at the end of the day, I mean, the Nuggets are just so good. I don't know if that changes at all for you, your pre series prediction, but no. I still feel pretty good about Nuggets in five. Yeah, no, I feel 
very good about Nuggets in five, and at times there was there was periods there where I was thinking mm, maybe Nuggets in four. But uh, and, and the reason a lot of for a lot of that thinking was, and I think this would have been true again, whoever came out of the East. But the fact that 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 series went seven, whilst the Nuggets were able to finish off the Lakers Lakers in four, I do think that's going to be a dramatic advantage in this series. So. That, uh, when watching this game, game one, I was sitting there wondering, like, did Heat really cost themselves their best chance at a finals run here by not finishing that Celtic series in a sweep or maybe in five or whatever it may have been and finishing that one off early, allowing Jimmy to get more rest, allowing Bam to get more rest because these dudes have played a ton of minutes. They played a lot of hard minutes. And now to you, you need to have everything going at 100% to even have a chance against this Nuggets team. The fact that they sort of gave away two or three games against the Celtics in that Eastern Conference Finals, I wonder if that run, as great as it was to get them through that, the Eastern Conference, and particularly the Eastern Conference Finals, I wonder if that sort of impacted their ability now to really do anything in this uh, in this Finals run here to the point where the Nuggets are just the more, well, they're the better team, but they're the more, more rested team, the more locked-in team, and have more advantages more generally, let alone the fact that they're just more well-rested and um, obviously have home court as well. So, uh, look, I'm not going to put it outside the the realm of possibility that the the Heat just continue doing crazy, weird, you know, unexplainable stuff like they've been doing all postseason. But at the same time, I don't want to be disrespectful of what this Denver team is, who, in my opinion, is clearly the best, the, clearly the best team in basketball. Easily the best team. Um, they just they have an answer for everything. If you go zone, they can shoot over it. If they mm-hmm. Uh, go zone, you can get the ball to Jokic in the middle and he can see over the top and is the best passer in the league and can make mm-hmm. the right play every single time and find an open shooter. If you double him in the post, like he had this one play in the first half where a double came and as soon as there was a stunt, like the ball was already in the corner for a Bruce Brown three. Um, if you go into these pick and rolls and you go under, Jamal Murray is going to pull up. If you go over, you're playing one on two against Jokic and Murray. If you switch, Jokic can put you in the goal if you switch and Murray's got a big on him, he can break him down off the dribble. I mean, there's just no avenue that you can really pick at if you are the Heat. And like I said, maybe Spolstra is smart enough to find something that he liked in, you know, maybe that last four or five or six minutes of that game where he feels like he can go back to Haywood Highsmith had a really nice game. Maybe he becomes a, a fixture of the rotation. But this Nuggets team is special. They And it's great for Jokic too because this whole discourse about MVP and Embiid and all this stuff and him not being a winner. It's like, just give me a break. This guy's obviously the most talented player in the league right now. He is playing at in just another stratosphere and he deserves to to win at the highest level. So really happy for the way that they played for them. Um, really excited to see what kind of adjustments that he can make or not. And, and just to see if the talent and the coaching and Jokic and Murray are just so much better and they're one step ahead at every moment that the Heat just can't catch them. I, I think the Heat have adjustments in them, but I think Jokic is almost too smart for some of these adjustments. And like I said before, like in the fourth quarter, the, the Heat were playing way more zone than what I expected them to be doing. I expected the zone to come out in the non-Jokic minutes, but they played a lot of zone in the Jokic minutes and it was working in that fourth quarter period. Entering the fourth, Jokic had five field goal attempts, and he just basically decided, "I'm going to shoot and score he in took this over. zone. I'm going, to, yeah, I'm going to get middle, and I'm just going to absolutely dominate from a scoring sense." And he, he was dominating the game earlier from a playmaking perspective. Like I said, five field goal attempts, but he was just diming everyone up, particularly Aaron Gordon. But then, as the Heat went zone, Jokic went middle and started, uh, I guess, ball faking his way to the rim, and 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 Bam didn't necessarily know whether to play uh, Aaron Gordon, who was playing baseline, like the. He didn't know whether to help off uh, Jokic to to cover Gordon on the oop or whether he should be covering Jokic in the middle. The minute Jokic decided to just get middle and really look to be a scoring threat, and he just dominated that fourth quarter period from uh, an off- from a scoring standpoint. So that was an in-game adjustment by the Heat, but Jokic was just better and just dominated it. So this is one of those things whereby the adjustment came, that more adjustments will come, but just because an adjustment happens doesn't mean it's going to uh, have a net effect where it takes something away because sometimes it just doesn't because the other team is just that good and Jokic, like we said, is just the best player in basketball and doesn't care for your adjustments. He will just dominate them as he did in that fourth quarter. 
the heat margin for error is pretty much zero and we as people who cover the bulls know a little bit about that so this is a bulls podcast we're going to get into them but first i want to tell you guys about being a chicago diehard chdo diehard member um, as you know you can get all of our youtubes and all of well n- most of our articles written um, from myself covering the bulls obviously from mark when he chips in to nick moriano and Vinny and uh Just all of our guys, Ryan covering the Cubs, Vinny on the Sox. We've got all of the sports covered um, with really smart, high-level content. Um, Blackhawks just got the first pick in the draft. They've got their women, Yama, on the way, and we've got incredible coverage from them. So what should you do to support us here at CHGO and become one of our most revered members by becoming a diehard? You will get all the premium content that we write, like, for example the uh, pre-draft rankings, the big board, all the stuff I've been working on um, in my draft database that has you covered with notes and stats and video breakdowns and all the stuff that you want to see um, in the event that the Bulls do get into the draft or even if you're just a draft junkie like myself. So we've got premium written content. We've got merch in our CHDL locker, whether it's a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. Um, Got a ton of great stuff there. And if you sign up, you get a free shirt with your membership. You can also have um, access to our members only discord where we're talking with some of our fans and hanging out in there quite a bit. And then also, and most exciting is getting discounts to the events that we have. We'll have stuff for tailgates for bears games. And we did a takeover this year for a bulls game where we had a bunch of people come hang. And I think we're going to do a lot more of that stuff in the future. So Make sure to check out our CHGO Die Hard membership. You can find everything you need to know about it on our website, allchgo.com slash diehard. Those two last things is what I love most about that as well. The fact that you get access to the Discord and all the, you know, the benefits that come for, you know, getting together uh, tailgates or takeovers, whatever it may be. The fact that we're building a community here, I think that's the the best part of what we do at chgo in all city and in terms of like creating a community like that's what you drink beer for as well because you just want to be around your friends you want to be drinking beer together and what better way to get together with your mates and uh have a or slam down a few beers and make sure those beers are goose island type beers so that if you're not aware friends goose island is chicago's beer has been since 1988 undefeated champion over that 30 40 year period just just completely dominant in the sense that their beer roster the goose ipa is a six-time medal winner the goose is the equivalent of the Jokic, i think i think it's fair to say but uh, in addition to the Jokic type beer that, that Jokic ipa you have the trip tropical beer hug which i'm i'm dubbing as the jamal murray of this particular beer lineup you want to run a pick and roll with that goose IPA and the tropical beer hug, you are not going to be uh, mistaken, my friend. And then just roaming the baseline like Aaron Gordon does, you have a 312 pale ale, a wheat ale rather. So you've got that perfect balanced lineup in the beer lineup, but you've also got a deep, deep bench the Goose Island Beer Company has. So if you want to get um, get together with your friends, build that community that we spoke about before, if you've got some events coming up, then um, grab some ultra-fresh brewery-exclusive beers at Goose Island's original brew house on Clyburn Avenue in Lincoln Park or from their tap room on Fulton Street in West Town. So uh, if you want to get your hands on some beers, have some fun with your friends, go down and get a meal into you, watch some sports, whatever it might be, head on down to the Goose Island Beer Company and uh, tell them Will and Mark sent you. And I'm sure they will have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, probably, probably. but I do want to now take this opportunity to sort of transition into the bulls and their off season and outlook because there has been some discourse about, well, the heat had this magical run and they're a play in team. So maybe the bulls can do that too. And I just want to take some time to talk about why that's a silly stance. It's fucking stupid. Let's be honest. It's yeah. You're (laughs) That was, uh, that? yeah, you could say that it's dumb. It's <laughs> extremely dumb. Um, and I want to talk about why, but I think there's also some stuff that the bulls can take away from this heat team and what they've done. It's just not that they're close because just because the bulls were up three 
with like three and a half minutes to go in the second game of the play in against this very heat team that is now Odin one in the NBA finals does not mean that the bulls are by transitive property where one plus one equals two. So one plus two must equal three. That does not make the bulls contenders. Okay. It just doesn't because the bulls did. First of all, they lost that game. They could have made the playoffs had they won that game, but they lost that game. So they couldn't be in the playoffs. I think we just need to start there by saying that like, Maybe the Bulls could be better if they won games. That's basically what you're arguing. Do you think that's fair to say? I mean, yeah, the Bulls would be better if they won games. They'd be better but... if they won games. That's the argument. <laughs> so, so, so would every every team in the NBA. But the, the reason why this whole comparison falls flat is the Heat were under uh, underperforming from a shooting point of view, which we're going to get into. It's not like they just randomly caught fire. They actually have good shooters on their roster that weren't performing. But beyond that, like they have a top 10 player who was like top five, top 10 in all advanced metrics. They have one of the most versatile and best centers in the NBA. Oh, and by the way, they have the best coach in the NBA. And this exact team who has been together for three, four, five years now has a history of putting together long and deep playoff runs, something that the Bulls just haven't done. So the framework existed for the Heat to do something like this? Was it probable? Was it expected? Absolutely not, based on how they performed in the regular season. But if there was a team that had the ability to flip the switch, so to speak, it was a team like the Heat who have that history, who have that background, I suppose, and who have the infrastructure and the players to do the sort of thing, which the Bulls clearly absolutely do not, which is why this whole thing is very dumb. Yeah, and I think that, that that's like the... The long and short of it but I, I do want to just spend some time on like this idea that the bulls have the infrastructure in place because like you said they are just i think they're just missing so much of it and to compare themselves to the heat who have been in the eastern conference finals three out of the past four years including two finals appearances i think it's clear that they underperformed in the regular season as opposed to the bulls who did exactly what they have been doing for the last two years, which is be in like the average or slightly above or slightly below area and then lose a game in the clutch. I mean, that is really like the story that I think you can take away from it is the heat performed really well to finish that game or to finish um, games in the playoffs. And the bulls did not, they, they can't close games. And I think that's in and of itself a really important takeaway. Um, so let's, so I don't know if you want to, get into any of those in more detail, but I think there are some really interesting things that the bulls can and should look to take away from this. But the idea that like they're close because they were the closest ones to beating the heat, I think is just, is just pretty far off. Yeah. I mean, they were close in one game, but one game doesn't determine your entire positioning here. Like, I mean, ultimately, yeah, the heat underperformed, but they still had a winning record. Like, the Bulls just didn't even have a winning record. You can't convince me that this team that doesn't have a winning record could be doing something similar to what the Heat have done. But to your point about, like, if we want to bump the Bulls a few extra games here and maybe that'd be a, a bona fide playoff team, etc. Like, so with the Heat, the Heat won 44 games. If they won three or four more games, they would have been a four, uh, they would have been a five seed. And them doing what they've done now is less probable, in, or well, less palatable, I suppose, or more palatable, if I'm speaking correctly. So the fact that, They finished eighth is why people are going on about this, but it's not like they're a typical eight seed in that sense. So, uh, but yeah, I think we should get into why what the Heat have done is not an indicator as to what the Bulls could have replicated. And then maybe we can, you know, close the podcast in terms of things that the Bulls can take from the Heat. But I think we need to set the foundation at least as to why, why this wasn't necessarily possible. And we've sort of touched on it, but maybe we can expand on it. Yeah. So I think the, the first thing, is the shooting we've touched on it quite a bit here but in the regular season the heat were ninth in three-point attempt rate the bulls were 29th i think that speaks volumes um Mm -hmm. and you look at the way that these two teams are playing or the the contrast between the bulls and the heat in terms of their style of offense so much of it is just running around coming off of pin downs dribble handoffs uh, another dribble handoff if there's no opening um, getting mm-hmm. guys on your back in these dribble handoffs and getting downhill like 
there's just so much action happening at all times. And no, the, the Heat do not have like a Steph Curry or, you know, whatever. They, they're, their two primary ball handlers are pretty much non-shooters. Like Jimmy does not shoot threes during the regular season. Bam Adebayo does not shoot threes. But because they have so much action going on in the form of shooters coming off of pin downs and dribble handoffs, like we see it all the time with Max Struess and Duncan Robinson in these playoffs, because of all that action, that is creating offense off of those guys, as opposed to Patrick Williams or Alex Caruso standing in the corner and waiting for somebody to create offense that results in that corner three. I think that's a huge difference where it's not just like add a shooter. It's have, I guess the way that I describe it is it's not so much that they need to have guys who can shoot. You need to have shooters on the floor that really put pressure on you to not just catch and shoot spot up attempts, but to create offense by, you know, being put in actions and force you to get guarded when the ball is not in Jimmy or Bam's hands. Um, We see that with the Warriors. We see that, you know, with the Grizzlies trading for Luke Kennard, like these teams that are kind of stagnant in the half court, they need a way, another outlet for offense that doesn't necessarily have to be a guy pounding the ball at the elbow. That is a really good way to do it. And so to me, it's not just like up the ante on three point attempts. Um, We talked about it a lot this year as if it was just like, well, the bull shot 33 point attempts tonight. Maybe next game they should shoot 35. I think that's part of it. But to me, there's a bigger difference between the total number of threes they take, which needs to improve, but also the quality of shooters that you have that can create offense for Zach or Damar or Vooch or whoever it is out there such that they have like secondary offense. They're not just having to create everything that results in secondary offense. Yeah, that's all a really good point. And, and this, to your point, there's a difference between guys who can finish shots and guys who can move and shoot the way a Duncan Robinson or a Max Drews, Tyler Hero. We haven't even mentioned Hero and, you know, for good reason, he hasn't really been part of this, this heat run, but like, the way they've been shooting, they've been doing it without arguably their best backcourt creator. So there's even more scope for them to do stuff off the bounce from a shooting point of view, whether that's from three or getting into the mid range, like as, as hero does. So they just have guys who can put the ball on the deck and get to their shot like hero, or to your point, they have guys like Struce Robinson, Gabe Vincent, who can just run off a series of picks and shoot and create movement off ball you know, in particular or get into that DHO game with Bam, and then just that just creates so much space, which is just a thing the Bulls do not have. So if the Bulls want to take something away from this heat run, it is prioritizing shooting, but it's probably more so prioritizing a lot of shooting, but more importantly, prioritizing movement shooters. Yeah, okay, cool. Maybe you can get someone like P.J. Tucker, or not exactly P.J. Tucker, because obviously he's signed to the Sixers, but like... Jay Crowder. Whoever it may be, yeah, like the, these guys will sit in the corner and they'll fire up catch and shoot threes, which is good. It, like that would be a welcome addition to this Bulls team who didn't have a lot of that. But you've got to go a step further. We need to get movement shooters. Seth Curry's and is a uh, what's the name a free agent in this up- upcoming off season. He's a guy who c- you can obviously spot up and catch and shoot, but he's someone that you can throw off a million picks and and you can trust him. To, uh, to you know, to hit those shots in the way that Duncan Robinson and Max Struess do now. Not maybe not necessarily tonight, as we said, those guys were one of thirteen from three. But more generally, you feel confident in them finishing their movement threes, which is far more valuable than catch and shoot threes. And then maybe it's a stepping stone. Maybe you just maybe maybe there's, there's no movement shooter out that the, the balls can get their hands on, and you have to sort of limit yourself or or come back to just getting a whole bunch of catch and shoot shooters, which I won't complain about because that would, like I said, would be a welcome addition. But the next step, that next level up, when you are got a team that can really get that three-point attempt rate up, those teams have a lot of, maybe not a lot of, but they have two or three guys who can come off picks and be movement shooters. And that just changes the, the entire dynamic of your offense. And if you're going to build an offense around Vooch and Levine and DeMar, three guys who don't get up a lot of threes, like even Zach, like he's one of the better shooters in the NBA, is a movement shooter or could be a movement shooter, but he just doesn't get up a lot of threes. Around that core, you need to have that movement shooting element, which is a good thing that the Heat have done around Bam and Jimmy because, as to your point, those guys aren't just going to shoot threes. So you need someone else who can do that, and they've identified that and prioritized that in years past. And I think I was listening to um, Cash Considerations today with Ricky and Jason, who obviously are great and do a great job, and they had Mm -hmm. Stefan No, our guy, 
Mm -hmm. on. And Stefan made a point that it's like, that I really agree with, which is, it's not just like add a shooter to your point. Like, it'd be nice if you could get a Jay Crowder type to put in the corner, but like you, it would be great if you could even get two of those guys, but they need to get like four or five or six (laughs) new guys in the back end of the rotation that they can filter through that all have shooting upside because right now they've completely under indexed on one of the most important skills in the game. And I think especially from that role player position that really helps open up the game for your stars. Like right now the bulls are not making life easier on Zach or Demar with the way that their offense is run because there's no movement around them. You can load up the paint and you know, they're trying to get to the line as much as they can to try to compensate for the lack of three point shooting. That's really hard to do when you're just crashing into four or five bodies down there. So I think you need to add multiple high level shooters multiple movement shooters, like you said. Um, and that's that's obviously, I think, you know, sort of a, a common talking point about the offseason. But it's not, yeah, I, I think the difference for me is that it's not just like adding guys who can shoot, it's adding shooters, adding guys who create offense through their shooting to really open up the game for the guys around them. Um, another one I think that the, uh, the Bulls can take away is having is prioritizing um, d- the development of young players. How do you find, draft, evaluate talent um, on the fringes, whether it's in the late uh, end of the back end of the first round, whether it's second round, undrafted guys, G League, like the Heat are always finding talent. Gabe Vincent, Max Strews, Duncan Robinson, um, Co- uh, Caleb Martin was waived <laughs> by the Hornets. Um, these guys and, and Haywood Highsmith tonight had a great game. These guys are all developed into a system that the heat have had in place. And I think that allows you to have, if, if you are capable and confident enough in your ability to develop that talent, it allows you to go out and spend in big ways on your Jimmy Butler's and your Bam out of bios. Um, it even allows you to have some misses in the form of like, I don't want to say necessarily misses but Duncan Robinson I don't think has necessarily lived up to the contract that they had hoped for him he did not play a lot during the regular season obviously has come around here in the playoffs but for him to have such a large chunk of the cap relative to the rest of the team you'd want to get maybe a little bit more regular production around them but that's okay because they've also got Max Struess on like a one million dollar contract because they use the um the full non non taxpayer mid-level exception on Caleb Martin and they use the bio annual exception on Kevin Love. Like I think they just, they utilize the tools that they have uh, really well. And I think, you know, the bulls have done that at times. They were very creative in the way that they did that when they first put this group together, obviously that has sort of fallen off, but the, the key point remains finding and identifying the talent that you want and then making sure that that talent it, uh, has the skill set that like we just talked about complements the star players, like the guys that they brought in in the second round, IO Dale and Terry late in the first round. um, They can't shoot. So it's really difficult to justify playing them. And I think those should be sort of the indicators of how you look to find guys. And then once you have them develop them. Yeah. They're just getting just more production from the end of bench guys. Like, uh, I mean, the Bulls had absolutely nothing from Tony Bradley and Marco Simonovic, and maybe you can say the Heat are getting absolutely nothing from an on-court production point of view from a Udonis Haslam, but obviously we know Haslam has an impact on that team from a locker room point of view, so I would argue at this point that a 40-something-year-old Udonis Haslam was probably a more productive minimum signing, end-of-bench signing than Marco Simonovic and Tony Bradley. So the Bulls just need to utilize the, utilize those end-of-rotation pieces a lot better than what they have in the past. You, you have to take swings. You have to develop guys, as you noted. And as we're seeing, like the Heat are starting Gabe Vincent, Max Struess, and Kayla Martin in a finals game. All guys that they brought through on minimum deals. Guys who were unheralded in a lot of respects and have turned into guys who have been very influential players who have been instrumental in the heat going and doing what they've done in this in this postseason run. So, yeah, the Bulls just haven't had a real player sort of jump off the page in that sense. I guess Javonte came close to that last season whereby you're getting a, you had a guy on a minimum deal who 
was was certainly outplaying his uh, production or his contract value at that point. His production exceeded his contract value. Obviously, that sort of fell away this season with him being injured to the to the rate he was. But like that's probably the closest the Bulls have come over the last, well, probably in the AK era of having someone really outplaying their contract like that. And that's just one guy, whereas the Heat have four or five guys doing something similar to that. So those moves on the margins, that matters. It can change the dynamic of your team in so many different ways. And we've seen that with the Heat this with uh, the Heat uh, in this postseason. And I think the Bulls have tried to cycle through some of those back-end roster spots, um, not as much as you might hope, um, but and not as frequently, but you know, they had the Octetokounmpo kid in there for a bit. They had Tony Bradley who they moved off of like the guys Terry that Taylor they might ha- be a fond Terry Taylor might be a fond. I, I like Terry Taylor. He's got some um, really interesting, like rebounding Bruce Brown type of skill set. Um, Carly Jones has been great, but like he's five ten. you know, like, can he, can he really be something at the NBA level? remains to be seen obviously G league MVP and, and he was dominant down there, but like how much is that actually helping you with your big club? Um, I like Justin Lewis a lot and hopefully he gets a chance to play rehabbing from the ACL. Now he could be somebody who I think has, you know, as a bigger wing has size and hopefully has been working on his jump shot enough to where he could be sort of like that Jake Crowder type player. Um, but I think, that's like 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Like they, I think they need to be getting higher level production out of, you know, the Marco Simonovich spot, the Dale and Terry spot, even I had like these guys are fine and they've contributed, but you're not like unearthing gems. If you're just hanging on to the same guys that are just doing enough to, you know, keep you afloat while your real point guards injured sort of thing. Um, and I think they need to continue to cycle through those guys when they've seen that they're not capable or that they aren't going to be able to help you at that high of a level. Um, the contrast there being sort of this idea of a developmental system and program that the heat have in place that I think the bulls are trying to emulate. Um, you know, the reason that they haven't fired Billy is because they want to build a program from the bottom up. Like they want to have this sort of continuity And I say that intentionally because they want to be able to like have a version of heat culture where, you know, they're unified from Arturis to Billy to, you know, Damar and Zach at the top all the way down to the G league and the way that they run things through there. So I think that they're on the right track in that sense, but I just don't think they've done a good enough job at it to where you're really seeing the fruits of what they're trying to do. Um, Whereas the heat, I think, obviously have just done that to the highest level that you possibly could. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. Completely agree. They're just, uh, they're better. They're better in a lot of ways. What, what, what the hell would Bulls culture even look like at this point? <laughs> what is Bulls culture? Will we? Bulls culture is uh, a dark place, I think, right now. <laughs> the dark place. Um, that's, well, that's let, let's, let's take a quick break here to talk about Shady Rays and then... We'll talk Nuggets a little bit more and what can the Bulls do to get themselves a little bit closer to some of these teams who are playing in the NBA Finals right now? Yes, William. Well, when it's not dark and that sun is out and you want beer that is built to last, our friends at Shader Rays have you covered for the warmer weather that's ahead, particularly in the US. If you need to get your hands on some premium polarized shades at an affordable affordable price, then our friends at Shady Rays have you covered. They are an independent sunglasses company that offers a world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair you may have worn in the years past. They have durable frames and extremely clear optics for outdoor adventures, or even if you're getting around downtown and you want to throw on a sleek, cool pair of Shady Rays, um, do so, friends. But that's not all. Importantly, Shady Rays offers the most insane protection in all of our, all of eyewear. Every pair of sunglasses is backed by their lost and broken replacements policy. So if you lose or break your pair, even if it's on day one, they have told William and I that they will send you a brand new pair, no questions are asked. Wear your Shady Rays with confidence because they have your back long after you purchase your pair of sunglasses. So that sounds interesting to you, friends, and uh, you want to get your hands on some sunnies here exclusively 
for CHDO listeners. Shady Rays is giving out the best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use promo code CHDO for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. You can try them out for yourself. Over 250,000 people online have given Shady Rays, the business, a five-star review. Maybe you can be the 250,000th and one. Is that how you would say that number? You can be yeah. one of a lot of a lot of people that have said this brand is worth five stars. So uh, take it from Will and I that this is something worth your time, worth your money. And uh, yeah, again, tell them Will and Mark sent you. <laughs> uh, we also need to get sent or somebody needs to tell us, tell them that we sent them to ComEd. So Mark, can you, can you help me tell the people here about our friends at ComEd? Yes, I will tell people, and I'm sending them to the Comed Energy Efficiency Program. That program, William, is committed to helping families and businesses in the communities they serve, helping manage energy usage and lowering energy bills now and into the future. That is correct. Comed offers a wide variety of incentives on lighting and other efficiency upgrades to commercial, industrial, and public sector customers of all sizes across their territories. Comet offers free facility assessments that can help them find energy saving opportunities like for HVAC systems, which I need in my apartment right now because their conditioning is not working and it's extremely hot in here, such as commercial kitchen equipment, such as industrial processes. So William, for you, like with your HVAC system issue, how would you go about getting this all sorted? So I'm going to reach out to an authorized engineer who will work directly with me to develop a detailed assessment plan specific to my goals and needs. These can be done in person or virtually and last approximately two hours. Then within three to four weeks, customers such as myself will receive a report detailing energy efficiency projects that we can start working on immediately. Each recommendation will include estimated energy savings, cost savings, project cost, potential incentives, and simple payback. If you own a business, do not wait. Get started saving money and energy today for energy saving tips, lighting incentives, or to schedule your free facility assessment, go to comed.com slash powering biz. I've just got my notepad and pen here. I'm just making note of that website. Was it comed.com slash powering biz? Comed.com slash powering biz, B-I-Z biz. Get your appointment scheduled today. Beautiful. All right. Anything else you think the Bulls can take away from, from the heat? I think, you know, we're also looking at a group of super smart high IQ players up and down the lineup that that certainly helped uh yeah that that would definitely be something <laughs> that, they, they, that they need to invest in more two-way guys guys that can play multiple positions um that would be ideal but the first thing that came to mind when we were sort of penning this outline or when, or when you pen this outline to be fair um use your mid-level exception that would be nice <laughs> like if the if the heat had not used their taxpayer mid-level exception on Caleb Martin. I think it's pretty clear to say that this Heat team certainly is not in the finals, probably don't win the Eastern Conference finals. Who knows how far their their playoff or postseason run goes. Just use all of your available tools, whether that's uh, Kevin Love on the biennial exception. Yeah, okay, cool. The Bulls have used that in the past on someone like Tristan Thompson, who's not a real NBA player. Uh, you can question maybe if Kevin Love is at this point. But I don't know, man. Tristan Thompson looked great in the Western Conference Finals. <laughs> <laughs> for the Lakers. For the Lakers, not necessarily the Bulls. In the one game uh, he played this year. The point is, what, whatever available options you have to your exceptions, whatever it may be, use them because you can get some decent role players who can help you do that. And that extends beyond the heat. Look at the, over the other side of the, uh, or the other team competing in this uh, in this finals period at the moment. The Denver Nuggets signed Bruce Brown with their taxpayer, pay, taxpayer mid-level exceptions. The Bulls had access to the non-taxpayer mid-level exception, which is more than the taxpayer mid-level exception. It's a three to $4 million more, meaning the Bulls could have reasonably gone after someone like Bruce Brown, offered him more money, offered him more years than what the team can do on the taxpayer mid-level. These teams who are really pushing it and are trying to win titles, they're using all their available assets to do so. The balls are not. So that's a ethos, methodology, maybe ownership constraint that maybe some of these teams don't have that maybe the balls do have. So it's not necessarily just on management in that sense. It could potentially be an ownership question too. 
But if you're not using all your available assets, whether like, like we said before, as we sort of noted before, whether you're not using or cycling through your G League team or finding end of bench guys or using your first round picks correctly or wasting second round picks in trades, whatever it might be, but more holistically and probably more importantly, not using your exceptions on good ready-made players who can help your rotation. Like we saw the difference in how the Bulls looked the minute they got Patrick Beverly. And I don't think it was necessarily just because of Patrick Be- Beverly and his talents. It was just the fact that they had another guy in the rotation who could credibly play 20, 25 minutes a game. And by doing so, now you know the coach trusted seven guys instead of six, six and a half, something like that. So th- it really matters. You need to use your available tools and the team for a team like the Bulls who do have access to their mid-level exception again this offseason and their biannual exception, you need to use them. And I know if you do so, it might push you into the tax, but you're not a serious team if you're not interested in using those tools anyway. So um, be like the Heat, be like the Nuggets, and actually use them. Yeah, I think you're just leaving you know, meat on the bone. You're not... Mm-hmm. And, and then expecting to be... you know, Expecting to get everything out of the group. Like You, you have to, to turn over every stone. And I think when you don't do that, these are the results that you find. Um, you mentioned Bruce Brown. Obviously, the Nuggets have done a fantastic job putting a roster together around Jokic and Murray. Um, you kind of made a crack at it earlier, and it is crackworthy. But I do think that there is something to the idea that AK was trying to build something similar, maybe a poor man's version of Jokic and Murray by bringing Vucevic to play with Zach Levine. And you can see the rough outline of it. It's not, you know, colored and shaded and written in pen, but like the the outline of it is there, right? Like you have sort of this offensive hub that you can run through the post. That's a good passer from the elbow who can be sort of a, a dominant scorer at times, but can really be sort of like a offensive hub, a point guard in a sense, getting into your offense. And then you've got this really dynamic offensive weapon who can score at all three levels who kind of needs somebody to be the true shot creator, shot initiator to, to really be optimized. And so I think that was in part the idea of bringing Vooch in to play with Zach. Um, and I think we, we kind of addressed this a lot over the years in terms of, you know, how we believe what held them back was that they kind of went all in for Vooch and then stopped and then weren't all in anymore. They kind of went three quarters of the way in to get Vooch and then, you know, brought, brought in the group around them. And I think they did a pretty good job of that. But then once they had it together and they still recognized that there were flaws, they stopped. And what the nuggets have done this year is, or not necessarily just this year, but year after year, they've sort of realized what their weaknesses were and tried to address them. They've gotten really elite defenders to flank the wing um, and, and sort of insulate around Jokic and Murray in Aaron Gordon, in Kentavious Caldwell Pope, and now Bruce Brown. They've got incredible shooting with MPJ and KCP, and Bruce Brown's shot the ball extremely well, and Murray and Jokic can shoot the ball. Like they're just super dynamic as a three point shooting team. And then they've got elite positional size. Like Murray is. Their smallest player, obviously, he's like 6'4", 6'5". But aside from that, it's like KCP, 6'6", MPJ, 6'10", Aaron Gordon, 6'8". Like, you've got these giant people that are clearly putting a ton of pressure on Gabe Vincent to not be able to switch because otherwise it's an Aaron Gordon layup under the basket. Um, And the Bulls have, you know, Caruso, 6'4". Caruso, 6'4", 6'5". Zach, 6'4", 6'5". Like, Io, 6'4". Like, there's... These guys that are, you know, out there doing their best and defending as as best they can just aren't going to have a chance to compete at the same level as somebody who's six eight, six nine, six ten. And that's just like a size thing. That's just like, you know, you need to have more than one guy who's six seven but below seven feet. And the Bulls have one. And I think that is just clearly an area of need. So um, when we talk about adding shooting, I think shooting with size and shooting with defense and shooting with IQ are also incredibly important. Yeah, and athleticism. I mean, that's the stark thing in watching the uh, in watching the Nuggets, and this is probably where Calvin Booth has really deviated from um, from uh, AK is 
I mean, we could probably credibly say the Bulls have two wings right now, Patrick Williams and DeMar DeRozan, and thereafter it's just a bunch of you know, guys that are six foot five and under, whereas the Nuggets are just this massive, massive team, as you to- as you spoke about, which if you're trying to build a team that's trying to emulate Jokic and Murray like as that like foundational offensive standpoint from a, a Zach Vooch pick and roll, maybe is like 60% of a Murray Jokic pick and roll, whatever it might look like. Um, then you need to, you know, continue that that uh, copy paste type element of things by actually getting more than one or two forwards on your team that could le- le- legitimate, uh, legitimately cycle through that rotation. Like we we made this joke about, uh, I think when they picked up Terry Taylor that, that the Bulls are only interested in power forwards who are six foot four and under. Like Javante, Derek Jones Jr., Terry Taylor, like these these are your backup power forwards who are like six foot four, six foot five, and off the bench, like the, the, the Nuggets have Christian Brown and, and Jeff Green. They've got obviously Aaron Gordon, who's built like an absolute truck. Like they've just got size all over their joints. Uh, MPJ running off screens, running off pin downs. Like talk about a movement shooter. That dude's almost like seven feet. So they just are so much bigger than the Bulls. And that has to be an emphasis in this offseason too, whereby not only do you need shooting and you need all these, uh, you know, wing options, but you need big wing athletes too. And this is probably the Bulls issue that they have that they only have so many assets to use, but they have so many, so many holes to fill. So it's cool. Like, okay, we'll, we'll prioritize shooting in this off season, but uh, you're still going to have some wing depth issues as well that you need to prioritize, which I don't know if you can sort of fundamentally address in this off season. Ideally you do it at the same time with uh, you, you grab someone who's six foot eight, who can, you know, shoot and play defense, but maybe that's not always possible, but the nuggets have seemingly done that over a slow build over the last couple of years. But, that's something the Bulls ultimately definitely need to replicate if the idea is to keep DeMar and Vooch and, and Zach together. And they sort of started doing that with the Pat drafting. But again, like 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 we talked or like you touched on before, whereby they sort of stopped halfway or three quarters of the way around building around Zach, Vooch and DeMar, that they stopped halfway in, you know, identifying big, talented, strong wings who could be two way players. They got in Pat who is on a path to being that type of player, but then they haven't really shown any emphasis of getting in anyone else who can do something similar. So that's something that needs to change too. And then on top of it, it's the development piece that we talked about too, right? Like I don't think anybody feels great about the rate of development for Pat or for Dale and Terry or for IO or Kobe for that matter, like who did actually show some improvement this year. I just don't know that the way that the bulls, and I'm not sure exactly if I could put, my finger on why, but for some reason, maybe it's the fact that they just aren't able to be a part of an offense that has like motion and movement. um, And that a lot of it is very much standstill to where they can't really like get a rhythm at any point throughout the course of a game. And it's just all kind of waiting for your chance to catch and shoot a corner three. I don't know if that's it or, or if the bulls players just aren't as good as we would hope that they could become, um, or if the Bulls developmental staff is failing in some capacity, but the development piece has to be there too. And even when you look at some of the Heat's mid to late first round picks, Bam and Hero were both, I think, 13 or 14. Um, And obviously they've gotten way more than what you would normally get out of that draft position. Um, Jokic was drafted 41st. I think that kind of tells you everything you need to know. And obviously he's a superstar and you can't just always find a superstar in the second round, but the idea of investing in some of these players to where they can really become these guys who, you know, have the physical tools, but also learn how to shoot at a high level, because I think that's really what AK has drafted for is bigger guys like Dale and Terry, like Patrick Williams, and hoping that he can teach them to shoot um, and hoping that their basketball IQ can come through and, you know, help them in various other aspects of of their game so got just a a minute or two here remaining but i'm curious like they've they've obviously got all these holes and maybe the nuggets and the heat are just better at solving those questions than the bulls are but how do they how do they do it you know they don't have draft picks it's going to be hard to find guys who are young and cheap enough to be able to develop they're going to have to maybe look at the undrafted market look at g league and, and and players in that level but you've also got limited cash and limited 
ability to go out and spend for some of those guys, even if you do have the mid-level available. So what's sort of the, what's your quick version of the answer to finding that kind of talent without the resources that other teams might have? Well, I'll go one step further and assume you can't get that for whatever reason, whether it's because you have no picks or whether it's ownership just being douchebags and are constraining you to add additional salary to the roster, whatever it might be. And if that's the case and you're left to your own devices, you're left with the same group and you're trying to to do something, what the Heat and what the Nuggets do extremely well and maybe what the Bulls don't do so well, and this isn't just for the Bulls as well, but it's true even on the team like the Celtics who are just uber talented, but everyone knows their role and everyone is locked into that role. And you think about someone like Michael Porter Jr. as an example who Shaw is on a max contract, but the way that dude has bought into being an off-ball guy, the way he's ter- he's bought into being a movement shooter, the way he's bought into actually being a, a decent defender at this point and being comfortable being the third guy, like someone like him has really bought into a role and accepted a role and has been extremely coachable. And I just don't know if the Bulls have ever reached that level with their guys, whereby you know they still really don't know, even two, two and a bit years later, the way they use Vooch or the way they don't use Vooch, I suppose, the way that it sort of comes and goes depending on a game-to-game basis, like the fact that we're still having those conversations or questioning why doesn't Vooch get more of the ball or this or that or who's the, who's the lead guy at the end of games and like just these series of questions where the offensive hierarchy just hasn't been established, those sorts of things, and people don't necessarily know their roles from that point of view. That's not a thing that the Heat or the Nuggets deal with at, 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 any, at any level. So if you have these constraints where you can't add talent and that may be a real, you know, a, re- a reality that we're dealing with in the offseason, then it's about, you know, making the best of what you do have and getting clarity on role and people understanding how they all fit into the pieces or the, the greater cog, then that's how it happens. And that's what the teams like the Nuggets do, the Nuggets and the Heat do extremely well and the Bulls just don't for whatever reason. I think that's, an incredible point and um i hate to make it not the last one but the one the one thing i would add to that is that like you know you look at even the pistons right now who just spent 13 i think million dollars a year on uh monty williams 100 potentially a hundred million dollar contract like there's no salary cap for coaching staff or front office or training Mm -hmm. staff i think investing in those areas to try to find a leg up in any way that you can. Um, ultimately like it's a copycat league, but the people who find those competitive advantages have the competitive advantage until the the rest can catch up to them. Um, and you know, it's hard to know what goes on behind the scenes. Like, I don't know how the bulls group or front office or coaching staff compares to other teams. Um, you know, it's just, it's hard to say, but that has to be a, an area of focus, an area of emphasis, because I think that can unlock some of what you're talking about, which is like establishing a hierarchy, um, making sure people understand their role, having a common goal. Like this is not stuff that you should struggle with if you're trying to compete at any level. Um, and I, and I, like you said, it's been a couple of years now and, and it seems that the bulls still have issues with that. Um, Anything else you want to add before we sign out here? No, I think I think I'm good, man. I think I'm good. Maybe we do a, a one a, a, an ad read on a Fubo TV, and then we can get out of there. Right? Yeah, well, I just wanted to make sure that we re- reminded people that um, you know, obviously, the finals are here, and you can watch it all on Fubo TV. They have 140 other live channels of sports, movies, and shows, which you can sc- stream on any device. Um, you can watch all of Chicago sports, whether it's the Sky, White Sox, Cubs on Marquee and NBC Sports, and obviously the finals on ESPN with Fubo TV. You can use the link in the description to sign up for 15% off your first month of Fubo. Mark, um, always a pleasure talking with you. It is a little bit unfortunate to sort of put the, the Bulls in, look at them through the lens of where these other teams are and how they're excelling. But I do think like if you're trying to compete against these other teams, you have to know how, how they succeed and what you can do to try to reach that level. And then once you get there, try to find some of the competitive advantages through other areas that can give you a leg up because obviously the bulls have talent on their team. 
And, you know, who knows if they can pull it together by the time these guys are too old or expired or whatever. But um, I think there's just a lot of some, some of this infrastructural stuff that you look at in comparison and it just, it makes you wonder how close the bulls actually are, despite the fact that they led the heat by three in the second game of the play-in with just three minutes and 45 seconds to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we're being unfair comparing the bulls to the nuggets, but I don't think it's unfair to look at what the heat have done and try to replicate some of that. Like I said, I don't think that was possible to do that this season or that the fact that you were three minutes away from beating the heat, therefore you were three minutes away from having a run like the heat. I don't think that was ever on the cards, but if you want to turn next season into something that somewhat mirrors what the heat have done as an example, not necessarily what the nuggets have done because the nuggets have the best player in basketball. The balls can't replicate that, but can you build uh, a good, a good team like the Heat, a team who has the ability if things flip for them, where you can make a postseason run of sorts. Maybe it's not going in the finals, but maybe it's winning a second round or getting to the second round, or maybe if things fall your way, getting to the Eastern Conference Finals. I've always thought that was possible with this team. I will die on the hill that says, had this roster been put together in a different way, that even with the trio of Vooch, Damar, and, and Zach, that you could have extracted more than what the Bulls have had. But it's all that more, all that stuff on the margins um, that we've, we discussed, which they've gotten wrong, which teams like the Heat haven't, and that's what the Bulls need to focus on. If they really want to be a team like the Heat and think they can do what the Heat have done, then win the stuff on the margins that you've consistently lost. Exactly. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there, Mark. Always great to talk with you, and we will be back next week when Matt and Dave return from Denver. They were out there tonight at the DNVR bar watching the game with our guys out in Denver. Um, so I imagine they are having themselves a good night and we'll be back on Monday to talk about their experience and talk about what else is ahead with the bulls and with the NBA finals. So Mark, thanks again. Follow him on Twitter at MK hoops. I'm at will underscore Gottlieb. We are at CHGO bulls and we will talk to you next week.